Well, I'm going in now. It's good to see you kids there. Nice to see all you. Wow, what a night. What, what a night, huh? How beautiful can it be out here? Oh, yeah. Thanks for checking us out this evening. You know, we're the longest running live primetime musical variety television show in America. Tonight's our 980th show. There's a nice feel in the air. I don't think I can look away. There's a space so rare and true. It's in your face. Leaves no trace that it's been there. But if you care and walk the line, being alone or people are plenty. If you come from the land of hurt or you hate, drop the bone, drop the bone. If you feel sand trickling down your toes, nobody can know how a fish thinks when he's chomping onto a hook. Drop the bone, yeah, drop the bone. It's the title of David Gans's new CD, once again called Drop the Bone. He's dedicated this record to Caroline Goldie Rush, who told David, hey man, stop gnawing on your troubles. Get your shit together and get moving on. Drop the bone. Drop the bone. So David Gans is with us. Put your hands together for David. Also, through a, an interview that I did in 1996, in June, this man came down while he was going around the country with his new book, 20 Years on the Bus with Garcia and the Grateful Dead. It's actually called Living with the Dead. When you look at an interview taken some years ago, 22 it seems, and you think about what has gone through and what, when he said it then, was happening in the past, you get these nice little feelings about, wow, this is a little bit of rock history. And that's what it was with Rock Scully, manager of the Grateful Dead. Now he's passed on, 
and his son passed on a tsunami in Indo Indonesia. But his words will be in your mind. Yeah, it's too much, just too much. Hey, by the way, later at our show's end, anybody that knows David Nelson, he's also, he's be sitting in and talking about how Pigpen and Marmaduke got their names. <laughs> Pigpen and Marmaduke got their names. Well, now, if you don't understand or you don't even know what I'm talking about, it's okay, don't worry about it. Also on the show tonight, we'll have a little green turtle. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you, there's a lot, of, a lot of little green turtle people out there. How are we doing, by the way? Are you doing okay? Good, man. It's good to see you here. Thanks for checking us out this evening. I don't know any other way than just come down, get down, and, and, and get things rolling. And I think he's going to get his, get his thing rolling. Is that right? I try, try to push it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, some of you folks that have had your birthday, congratulations. It's my honor, my pleasure, the best times of my life. I've got to tell you, it's my wife. And I's 47th wedding anniversary. I'm so, 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 so pleased. That's my baby. That's my honey. That's my love. Right, so right now, I want to like all you people, if you're here in the audience, or you people up, up top, you people at home, check us out and get into the, the feeling of Mr. David. David Gans is on our stage. Put your hands together for him, please. Yeah. yeah. Rock and roll, yeah, we're teaming up for spiritual entrainment to fortify the body and the soul. Life is a jam, we live to jam. Our music is a soul collaboration. We sing and dance at every chance. It's a righteous conflagration of concerted inspiration. Our collective intuition brings our wishes to fruition. Jamming is a leap into the future. Uncertainty is not a thing to fear. Yeah, so when the music's playing us, no one has to steer the bus. We're Magellan, Captain Cook, and Marco Polo. What's next is not a jam, it's just a solo. And we don't know where we're going until we get there. And we don't know how it ends until it ends. We do our greatest work when we're not thinking. And no one can remember what played when. Yes, what we seek is not just entertainment. What we make is not just rock and roll. Yeah, we're 
teaming up for spiritual entrainment to fortify the body and the soul. Life is a jam, we jam to live. Our music is a soul collaboration. We sing and dance at every chance. It's a righteous conflagration of concerted inspiration. Our collective intuition brings our wishes to fruition. Jamming is a leap into the future. Uncertainty is not a thing to fear. Yes, yeah, so when the music's playing us, no one has to steer the bus. Now, depending on my mood and random factor, I'll groove or jam or segue or just aim. Looking for a melody Sing a simple song I'm just a little lonely now But there's nothing really wrong I find my inspiration Where it's been all along Time do I have? Do I have time for a whole nother song or? Oh my god, I have five more minutes. Good, I guess I'll play a whole nother song then. I forgot to look at my watch at the start of the number there. 
If just one dream could come true, I know what my dream would be. Last night I dreamed that Jacqueline was dreaming of me. If her voice was Irish whiskey and her blue eyes were the sea. Oh, what a drunken sailor I would surely be. For the pleasure of her kisses, I would dance across the sky. I sing this song the whole day long, cause she makes my heart fly. If her voice was Irish whiskey and her blue eyes were the sea. Oh, what a drunken sailor I would surely be. I put toothpaste in my beard and brush my teeth with shaving cream. I'm all confused and so bemused by love for Jacqueline. If her voice was Irish whiskey and her blue eyes were the same. Oh, what a drunken sailor I would surely be. I put toothpaste in my beard. I sang that already, didn't I? Dang. I was supposed to sing the first verse again. Hey, this is live, everybody. If just one dream could come true, I know what my dream Last night I dreamed that Jacqueline was dreaming of me. If her voice was Irish whiskey and her blue eyes were the sea. Oh, what a drunken sailor I would surely be. If her voice was Irish whiskey and her blue eyes were the sea. Oh, what a drunken sailor I would surely be. Ooh, ooh. Ah. Uh, nice. Oh my God. Do we get a, we get a close up? Oh yeah. Drop the bone. Yeah. And by the way, he's got this great bonus CD with us. I know you have a bonus too. All right. Yeah. And, th and this smaller one, which kind of fits inside this one, uh, has some of the songs that are on the, the first one. It's like a little different, a little fast, a little slower. Uh, a longer deal. It's really a, a sweet thing to do. Yeah, this is his, his 11th uh, CD that he's put out. Yeah, Drop the Bone. And the person, that, by the way, that's done the uh, the work on the front, I can't remember. Her name is Vikitsa. Oh, Vikitsa. Bolinus. Bolinus Yeah, look at here. I don't know, is there somebody there that has one of these? Yeah. Pa, 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 p
Well, he sure picks up a nice bone, eh? man. Hey, by the way, I didn't. Uh, the, one, not too long ago, you were on. You were, had written this song with uh, Blair Jackson or this uh, book. This is all a dream we dreamed. Did you guys catch this? Huh? Look. Yeah. So you're just like you're just doing so many different works. David Gans, thank you so much for coming here, and we can do a little bit of bit of yapping. I know it's, uh, it's great to see you, Bruce. Yeah, thanks, man. D you just got off. The, were you on the road or? Yeah, I go out. Um, you know, for a week or two each month, basically. Each month, so week. I know. don't. I'm not. I don't want to be on the road for long stretches, but one or two weeks, once a month or so, yeah. know, I go out. That's good. So huh? you got to go where the gigs are and. Uh, I get more gigs outside of town than I get in town. Although I have three local gigs coming up in the next week. In fact, I have a, 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 a list of them here. By the way, to, when you go, I mean, do you go like, are you going north, south? Are you going far, far east? The next trip west, is going to be to the northwest, where I haven't been in several years. I'm wow. doing a, a short trip with a Hawaiian guitarist friend oh, of mine, dude. Stephen Inglis. We're calling it Fragile Thunder. He's just releasing a CD of slack key style grape Oh God, songs. this is incredible. This is going to fit totally with your music. Saturday, March the 3rd, this is a, a week or so before uh, the Stevens uh, gig at 8 o'clock at China Cats, who's a great group, and you'll be performing and then with them and then uh, and performing solo, yeah. solo. That's at Eve's Waterfront, 15 Embarcadero West in Oakland. March the 7th, uh, Wednesday at 7.30. That's next Wednesday. It's yeah. Fragile Thunder. Yeah, that's the duo. Yeah, Dave and Stephen Inglis. It's at the, at the Monkey House. I haven't been there before. Hmm. Uh, also, um, our, our March the 8th, 5.30 at Testarossa Winery uh, in Los Gatos, or Los Gatos. You, you, are you going by yourself there, and then you? Perform? Yeah, that'll be a solo show. It's, it's their wine, their tasting room. A friend yeah. of mine books it. It's fun. I get dinner and a glass of wine. I get to play music for a couple hours. It's a lot of fun. I used to love wine. God, I was a, I'd, I'd sit for hours on the phone in the evenings and drink wine and try to and book the show months and months and months in advance. But then when I had this stroke thing, uh, I immediately stopped. No more drink. Well, and I thought, God, how lucky I was. So, I don't uh, know, maybe, maybe I could even get into to one glass of wine. How is it that you, well, you've got a lot of friends. That's what you told me earlier. You can get these incredible people working on the, on the DVD. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Life is a Dip by that. What a great song. Thank you. That's a really, really funny. Ah, uh, funny, yeah. Well, it is funny to me because, <laughs> you want to sit down? <laughs> yeah. You get all these wonderful people. Yourself, of course, Holly Bowling, oh, Bob she's Brelove. A wonderful piano player, oh, God, yeah. Bob Brelove was yeah. worked around with the dead for a while. Joshua Raul Brody, uh, keyboards and vocals. C.C. Dawson, God, uh, Jordan Fer Feinstein. Because that's not related to the Feinstein piano. No, he's different. Actually, he might be related to Feinstein, the piano guy, but he's not related to Diane Feinstein because they say it differently. They just ma made a thing on that uh, the Democrat people did not endorse her to be the, what's it called? That's old history. Uh, Terry Haggerty. God, he's really one of my favorite sort of guitarists. Great guy. I like to spend time, more time with him. Neil Hampton, John Haynes, Jeff Hobbs, Dave Jess, Joe Kyle, Bruce Latimer, Chris Rowan, Lauren Rowan. Oh, I, 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 I misspelled, yeah, all right. Oh, the Rowan Brothers. That was clever. Yeah. <laughs> the Rowan Brothers are wonderful, huh? Yeah. Remember when they first came on, they were like the, God, this next big thing. And this stuff happened, you know? I don't know. Oh, but, yeah. but they're still wonderful. They're still <clears throat> incredible. And they're still making their beautiful music. Yeah, we had a band together for a while called Rubber Soldiers that appeared I, on this I show know, some I years know. back. God. And this recording is from that period. That's about, I guess, Close to 15 years ago now. Wow. Is that what it is? It's been a long time. Maybe, maybe, maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Trombone, Greg Stevens, uh, Robin Sylvester. God. Robin Sylvester is an amazing guy. He's a bass player. He was in Rat Dog for a while. Yeah. He's an English dude. Big, tall English dude. Looks exactly like you'd expect an English rock star to look. 
I'm not going there, Dave. Okay. No. Uh, Allegra Thompson. Uh, this is the Thompson family. Remember years ago, they would have the Thompson guys come in? Uh, Eric would come and Susie, and then Eric alone and Susie. Uh, violin, vocals, uh, mandolin, gee whiz, Joshua Zucker. Huh. Pretty, pretty swift stuff, man. I'm really pleased you, you've gotten it together. And it, with this group of people, my God. And you, you just, I mean, you just sat down. And, how did, the, oh, but that, that's the other thing on the, on the, on the, on the uh, CD. How did you sort of sit down and begin it? Did, did, what was happening with, uh, the dog issue. It was somebody else. It was Peter Rowan or somebody doing something. Oh, the, the the name the the title comes from a phrase that that I learned from my late business manager and spiritual advisor Goldie. Goldie, yes. She used that phrase as a way of saying, you know, stop gnawing on yeah, yeah, all yeah. your, you know, stop obsessing. Basically, yeah, is what yeah. she said. And it, the phrase stuck with me. She passed away quite a while ago now. 2005 and uh, but I keep her with me all the time and that phrase just stuck with me over time and one one some years ago I was at a music festival out in Ohio and Peter Rowan was also there and I it occurred to me that he would be a good guy to work on a song with the idea yes. of drop the bone because he was a friend of Goldie's as well yes. and he's a Buddhist you know so the notion of letting go and, and uh, you know, owning your suffering and stuff yeah. is, was kind of what I wanted the song to be about. And we spent a couple of hours together in a hotel room out there in Ohio. And then we spent another couple of hours at his place out in West Marin. And we got, we got somewhere with a song. And then I kind of lost touch with him for a while. And right. several months right. later, his manager called me and said, I need your publishing info. Pete is recording your yeah, song. Yeah. And uh, you listened to it, and you sort of kind of liked it. But what happened? Uh, oh, I loved it. It's a great yeah. song, yeah. but it is so far removed from what I had thought we were writing, and yes, what yes. I think that song should be about. Right. That phrase, what that phrase means, right? But it, I certainly don't begrudge Peter his decision, and I, as a result, I have you know a so co-songwriting credit with Peter Rowan on one of his records, and yeah. that's a thing to be proud Pretty of. Pretty damn you know? nice, I agree. But the phrase sticks with me, and so I stuffed it into another song, a song that's on this record, a song called "Summer by the Bay." Yes. And yes. my use of it there is also inadequate. In the, you know, it doesn't really address the question at all. In fact, it's kind of a cheap yeah. use of the line as I think about it because it's the last verse is about a guy who's looking for a job and he says, I told my dog to drop the bone and find us a gig. Uh, so I kind of abuse the phrase too now that I think about it. I've certainly done that uh, many times in my life. <laughs> hey, uh, <coughs> the, uh, you, you put the bonus thing here, but you also, let's see, there was a little... Where the hell are we at? Man? There's a booklet inside. Oh, it's in here, yeah. <coughs> uh, I can't even see anything anymore. Uh, yeah, this little guy. God, I couldn't, couldn't get it down. It's so small. And I'm but, sorry. Well, no, but it's good because I mean, you know, you're not doing it for old turds like me. You're doing it for young no, people. No, no, hey, and dude, I'm people, an old turd like you. We have the little. Don't call me an old turd. <laughs> 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 yeah. The, uh, us, <laughs> we have the little things, you know, to put on to make it big, but this is really sweet because it tells tells us about Carolyn and uh, giving you sort of information and uh, you know and and things that have happened to you with you in your in your life. To, well, Tina Tina Loney, well, she she was sort of a namesake to you. She did some. Work right, and then and then she got she was ill. Is that right? Yeah, she was a, a dear friend of mine, uh, and you know, like an, a very important friend. You know. Yeah. You have uh, those. You need somebody like that in your life who you can tell the total truth to, and who will tell exactly. you the truth yeah, without BS yeah. and all. You know, Tina was that for me through some really weird years. You know. 
and she was in the process of dying of cancer after having beaten cancer a couple times before it finally okay, got man. her. Oh, and I was working on this piece of music while she was dying, so I just put a lot of my feeling into the song. Yeah, yeah. And I, I played it for her before she passed, and I named it after her, and I keep it with me as a way of keeping the spirit of my dear friend. Yeah, this dear is beautiful. These me. are really good words to, for people to hear, and I'm just totally right there with you on it. I, once again, because I, we only got a few seconds left, Saturday, March the 3rd, uh, 8 o'clock, you'd be up at China Cats, and nope. you'd play with them. And with play, the China uh, Cats. With yeah. the China Cats. And Eve's then, uh, Waterfront in uh, Oakland. Eve's, yeah. It's in Oakland. And Wednesday of the 7th, a Fragile Thunder, uh, David, and the Stephen Inglis. That should be really interesting. At the Monkey House. Boy, it's got that nice, you got the little rain <laughs> coming down, baby. Ooh. Yeah, I hear that. We Thursday, know. March the 8th, at 5.30, at Testarossa Winery. That could be a fun thing, too. Yeah. That's in uh, College Avenue there in Los Gatos. Jeez, Dave, the thing, I hope these gigs go well. Thanks so much. And Thank thanks you, for just continuing to put out work here and inspiration to me because I'm, I, it's there. I just don't know quite somehow what to do with, uh, I have to overcome sort of my physical stuff and, and my mental. And, and you're helping me. Thanks so much, man. You're a good cat. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Put your hands up. <laughs> oh yeah all right oh 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 i want to do real quick uh little green turtle is that what we're doing i think so yeah i i like a little green turtle this is nothing you know you just watch a little turtle dance i mean what is wrong with that all right okay there you go all right oh yeah turn that music up baby oh yeah that's what we're talking about Take that thing out. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to push back? Huh? You going to push it out? Huh? Oh, man. Now you got it. That's what we're talking about. When the moon comes up, oh, yeah. Goes down. That's when oh, you're really sort of you know, kind of on a long deal, aren't you? Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you, little green turtle. Oh, I'm going to make a little right turn. You know, that's what we're doing here. You know, that's what we're doing here. A little, 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 little creativity, a little light in the future, in the day, in the right now, and and all places beyond too. My next guest, as I mentioned earlier, going around around the country, so, to, so get people to buy his book, Living with the Dead. And he came on here in, uh, it seems to me, June of 1996. And we talked about what was going on and you know, what was happening with the Great Bill Dead. The book is just, I just think it's a, one of the good ones. As somebody earlier said, he gave away too many secrets or something like that. But he's passed on now. And, and I like to go back to, to people who have been on the show they will have been a part of history, and then we can go back and, and get a get a feel as to what sort of you know what, what he was thinking at the time. For instance, the, when he was first saw the band, he was they're just just not really great. And they look kind of shitty, and you know. and then and then when he had sort of what I call an attitude adjustment, he saw them again, and they really really look great. You know. Just really cute little things. Anyway, he's a uh, on our, our DVD, I'm sorry he's not you know here live, but he was here, and he's uh, on our our, our our screen right now. You want to stick around and kind of check out this little uh, interview, okay? All right. Welcome aboard. We're, we're tonight, yeah, it's sort of a special night. We're putting out a light that is is bringing us sort of, to, particularly to a lot of folks who are not, you know not really sort of hip to the inner workings or. Uh, do really don't know that much about uh, the group called the Grateful Dead or Jerry Garcia or some of the folks that were deeply uh, in part, you know, part of it, part of the part of the band, part of the group. And I thought, well, this would be nice. This would be a, a, a good thing. And we we haven't heard enough of what's going on. What, what you know? How did these people start? What what in the world made them? How did they even get going? How did they come across a young kid with a big old toothy smile? How did they get him to be 
the manager of a group, then it was, I guess they were called the Warlocks, but they were changing their name to the Grateful Dead. How did they get this kid, who was just, a, I don't know, some weeks before, uh, he, was, he was in Jung Crest, Switzerland, uh, he was trying to graduate from grad school, he was sort of a, uh, working on that to become the manager of the Grateful Dead. I want you to stick with us. We're going to get into, into this as much as we can. He, uh, this gentleman, his name is Rock Scully. He's written the book, Living with the Dead. Would you put your hands together for him? Uh, this is uh, very, very cool. Uh, by the way, you folks, you can get, you can still get. There's a few uh, uh, hardback editions out. So, uh, by the way, the, the publisher is uh, Little Brown. Yeah, Living with the Dead. You can still. There's a few of these left. I want you to get out there if you if you have such interest. I find it interestingly written. Now, of course, this is Rock Scully with David Dalton. Rock, tell, tell what, what the hell does that mean? You were, did you verbalize to him and then he wrote it or what? Well, uh, my, my life had been on the telephone um, or in the box office or on stage or backstage or arranging cars and hotel rooms and getting Grateful Dead out of trouble mostly. <laughs> um, and I needed somebody to tell this story to. And uh, one of the most interesting questions that everybody always asks me is how did I remember all this stuff? So I spent from uh, the whole year in 92 to end of 93 going around interviewing all my old friends and people that had worked with us and old crew guys and and uh, people that had been on the bus with us and uh, truck drivers and band members and old ladies and children and all of that stuff trying to refresh my memory I found out that nobody remembered it the same way but I needed somebody to sort of unload this on and I found out I couldn't write it in Marin County because Marin County was just too full of memories and and uh, too difficult uh, to put it all together. So I, I uh, drove my little Subaru all the way back to New York right. and hooked up with him. I tried a couple of other riders that might be able to do this because it pretty much rode itself. I mean, I, I put a lot on the brilliance of David Dalton. He did Marianne Faithful's book and sure, sure. so on. But I really needed somebody that knew about writing in the first person point of view kind of writing kind of thing. And that's sort of how I hooked up with him. But actually, I mean, so much of it is Dan Healy and Mountain Girl and, and, and all these other folks, and Marmaduke and David Nelson and all of these kind of people um, they helped me with this. And it's like me looking over your shoulder and, and what I see going on is a whole lot different than what you see going on over my shoulder. So it, very, without those points of views, yeah, I couldn't very, have done Very well put, because yeah. I think that's all of us, anybody here that's halfway awake would say, any uh, your book is how you saw experiences transpire and come out through you know also, uh, through the way that you do it and you wrote it down. That's how come uh, I haven't been sued yet. Yeah, because it's just my point of view. No, I think it's <laughs> I fantastic sue me for that. I, you know, it, well, <laughs> Although there are some objections to it. There's going to be objections to everything. Yeah. I swear. Once in a while, somebody will call and. Well, there's some stupid yeah. mistakes. I mean, the book was finished before Garcia died, and it wasn't supposed to come out until January. So, Jerry died, and then all of a sudden they put the whole big bums rush on me. It's got to come out right away, and 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 all the stuff I already fixed up. They call Mount Tamalpais in Marin County the Tamalpais Mountains. They misspelled my hometown, the Corte Madera. They misspelled that. You know, I mean, this is stuff I fixed up a long time sure. ago. And some actually, I, I seen me. I read a review uh, locally in one of the rags here, that uh, that you had screwed up, Rock, by saying such thing. I I'm, screwed up. Yeah, I, I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, this is some minor goddamn detail. Well, you know, but that's not unusual in in, in this neck of the woods with certain writers, uh, who uh, often take a sort of personal look at things rather than getting above it, looking at the, everything, and then sort of writing. They tend to sort of throw in their own little this and that. And uh, I, I, for my, I've read it, I think I've told you, f five times. I find it just immensely interesting. You've got all kinds of little stories and vignettes, uh, you know, from the uh, times of, of uh, traveling, getting on the road, going to different countries, Pro uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, getting through customs, problem. Uh, it's all true. Setting up all, all the damn shows. It's all true. I made uh, three, uh, four, five, uh, 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 four mess ups. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. excuse me, I'm used to radio. Sure. Yeah. 
Well, you were on KGO the other day, weren't you? On uh, something. Yeah, yeah, because they, you know, they don't. Yeah. You know. Uh, well, I, hey, man, I, that you're here is really cool. I, I'm, I was thinking a part of it of the book also where you mentioned, because we had mentioned Pigpen, how about how Pigpen's pop was the first sort of white uh, blues uh, uh, DJ on a black uh, station. I think it was at the time it was KDIA. He, that fella, I mean, he literally grew up in a family with, with lots of music in it. Yeah. So did Jerry Garcia. Yeah. That's right. I guess all the boys did, huh? At what point? Yeah, uh, but uh, from uh, disparate um, totally, backgrounds, yeah, incredibly yeah. disparate. <laughs> well, you heard David uh, Nelson talking about uh, yeah, right. about uh, the the bluegrass um, upbringings and so there on, which go. is what yeah, led yeah. to the New Riders of the Purple Sage and and all of that. But that's when I first met him, and that was on Grant Street. And that's the first time I met um, Janis Joplin was on on Grant Street too, mm -hmm. and she was doing howling old blues songs, you know, just by herself. And Garcia was picking a banjo. And um, it, it, I mean, it was wonderful music and everything, but they had to make the transition. And, and Pigpen was the guy that had the knowledge of the sort blues. Of, yeah, sort of the leader. Of the and band. so to go to electric music, they kind of took the lead from the Rolling Stones and somewhat from the Beatles, but mostly from the Stones. And it, the fact that English bands could be doing American blues and doing it funky and getting on KYA and KFRC in San Francisco and all of these stations and, and playing really wonderful American roots music. So Pigpen was the guy that knew the blues because of his dad. So that's sort of how it progressed into electric music. There is a part in the book, Rock, I want to, I want to read some of this, where you are, you're, you're, you're <coughs> At first, you sort of really didn't think these folks could 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 sort of make it. You had lots of doubts, and some of the, some of the stuff that you had written down. Here, I'm going to read this out. It won't take too long. You, uh, I know you had a, an attitude adjustment, and you start off with, "I try making a cold, professional assessment of the group while I still can." Well, I was a promoter still. <clears throat> All right, time. I begin taking inventory of the band members. Okay. There's the leader. This is a, rather embarrassing. Uh, here's a, a paunchy's Hell's Angel type with dirty hair down to his tits and greasy leather vest covered with mojo pins. There's a Mexican-looking guitar player with pyramid hair, a receding chin, and a missing finger. The bass player huh, has a full Prince Valiant page boy do. There's the second guitarist, a startled, long-haired child who could be a girl. And then there's this, <laughs> and then there's this surly juvenile delinquent on drums, a sorrier bunch you never saw. I mean, it's just frightening, actually. You know, they're never going to amount to anything. Just another local band getting gigs on Friday and Saturday nights, playing dances in high school gymnasiums. And then later, Rock, you sort of had a reappraisal, and you wrote, <clears throat> "Okay, so." They do bluegrass, blues, Beatles, folk, and jazz, all in the same song. Well, that's original, isn't it? And you know, the more I think about it, there really is no such thing as a song. No, all songs are the same song. Top ten hits, singles, jukebox selections, it's all, well, you know, arbitrary. I mean, music biz categories, ways of packaging this stuff, shipping units. Well, so so you came, you had a little change of heart, and you got into these people. What what sort of in your heart sort of got you to a place where you thought, man, this is this cat's gonna happen? First of all, um, <coughs> being a promoter, I was uh, one of the founding members of the Family Dog up in San Francisco. Right, right. I was tired of uh, burning uh, bands mm -hmm. because my job was to make sure that the promoter, namely me and my partners, actually came out ahead at the end of the concert. So what, whatever we could do, that's what Bill Graham did to us for years and years and years. So it was my job to, but I didn't like that because I was really in it for the music. That's what I wanted to hear was the music. And, and so um, when Owsley offered me the opportunity, and I had seen these guys Already, Keezy turned me on to him. A couple other people had turned me on to the Grateful Dead, and I, and I'd seen Garcia and the Bluegrass 
era on Grant Street and so on. I hadn't been down to Dana Morgan's, but I knew about Dana Morgan's. I knew Joan Baez. My, my father was her godfather. And, and so I was very hip to the music. My, my father also was one of the guys that started the Monterey Jazz Festival. So I knew a lot of jazz musicians and so on. I had kind of a classical upbringing listening to music and been educated in Europe and all that stuff. But when I heard these guys saw them first, it, it was frightening, just like I said yeah. it there. But as I listened to them, there was like more potential there for jazz and, and the blues and rock and roll and bluegrass and country and all of that stuff. And I mean, it took us years to move through all of this because we started out as a blues band, then we went in through the period of um, American Beauty, Working Man's Dead, mm -hmm. where we were uh, doing uh, more American roots, more out of the bluegrass and country stuff, and we're working with the new writers of Purple Sage and all of that. So, and, and not only that, there was, of course, psychedelics thrown into the whole mix, which was giving us on a song like Love Light or mm -hmm. one of these old blues songs, giving us these long extended breaks where a three and a half minute song would end up 17 and a half minutes. And, right. and I wanted to protect this. And so I got into <laughs> it and I went back to my, uh, to my connections in the jazz world and figured out, well, it's in the book also about how I tried to figure out what to do about um, that three minute thing that they give you uh, two cents for called a song and oh, there's right, gotta be right, 12 right. on the record and that kind of thing. So it, it became much more important for me to protect the rights of the musicians than it was to try to promote shows. So, so Owsley offered me the opportunity. I came down to the Big Beat in Palo Alto, saw him, went through this whole revelation. I think psychedelics could have had something to do with it. But by the end of the evening, I was convinced, you know. So, <laughs> so the, the band, we only got about a minute left, so we, right. we need to keep it a little on the short side. But uh, now that sort of, you know, Jerry has passed, uh, do you and your heart see anything going with, uh, with, that, with the Grateful Dead? I mean, you see them sort of picking up and moving along? Well, I think that's what they're doing. I haven't heard Mystery Box yet. Right. right. I've heard Rat Dog. Actually, I heard Rat Dog the night before Jerry died. And, and Weir got a flight in front of me, so I missed the funeral, but I made some of the events and went to Golden Gate Park and so on. But uh, uh, yeah, they'll go on. And, and the thing is, is I, what I really am concerned about are the people that love the Grateful Dead, the, the crowd, and, and amazing, they'll continue amazing forever. Amazing experience. Uh, to, uh, we've, uh, unfortunately, our time is done, but when we should have given you about 45 minutes. The, uh, whenever a group of uh, people have such a, an effect on other individuals, I mean, it is a phenomenon that is amazing. Thank you, Rock Scully, for coming to this place, sharing, sharing with us what you're thank all about. You, and, uh, and thanks for writing this book, man. Thank you. Cool uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Boy. Boy, what a nice, a nice uh, interview with this cat, huh? I sure <laughs> much prefer he would be alive and be uh, kicking. I, I, I thought his writing ability was wonderful. Anyway. That, that, that's what it was, and that, that's, that's what the time was in 96, and here we are right now, and it just kind of fits in. It fits in because you're here, we're here, and we're going to go back to the fellow that kind of opened our show, and he's going to give us another flavor, another you know big piece of his whatever, and you can put it in your mouth or put it in your brain, whatever you want to do is cool. David Gans is on our hey. program now. Put their hands together for him. It was a great interview there, Bruce and Rock Scully. That was fabulous. <laughs>
Poncho's a bandit boys, his horse was fast, his polished steel. He wore his gun outside his pants for all the honest world to feel. Poncho met his match, you know, in the desert down in Mexico. Nobody heard his die. the way it goes All the federales say they could have had him any day They only let him slip away Out of kindness I suppose Lefty can't sing the blues all night long like he used to. Just the poncho bit down south ended up in Lefty's mouth. Day they lay poor poncho low. Lefty split for Ohio. Where he got the bread to go Well, there ain't nobody know All the federales say They could have had him any day They only let him slip away I suppose Oh, it's still how Poncho fell he Left his living in a cheap hotel the Desert's quiet and Cleveland's cold So the story ends were told Pancho needs your prayers, it's true, but save a few for Lefty, too. He only did what he had to do. And now he's growing old. All the federales say they could have had They only let him go so long Out of kindness I suppose All right. Yeah. Oh. David Gans, thank you so much, man. Thanks for, for bringing your feel to everybody. Everybody was just sort of getting this right here from all over the joint. Oh, by the way, you know, this is our 47th anniversary of being married 47 years, the same gal. I just love her so much. She's just really basically taking care of me. I want to also uh, uh, bring back uh, to, the, to television a young man who was uh, David Nelson, and he was... Uh, just sort of talking to us about how Pigpen and Marmaduke got their names. This is on a show we did back in 1996. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and, uh, and do that if you wish. Hmm. That got to be a regular thing. That's yeah. where Pigpen got his name, too. It was after a Boris had seen one night, and uh, after every night we'd after playing, you know, that's the official gig, so to speak, you know. Uh, 
There's tapes of this too, but anyway. Uh, this is good stuff. Huh? You're, we're you're, coming you're, out of the store, ahead. and there's not a tape of this. We're coming out of the store, and everybody's milling around. And after the thing, we would all decide on where we were going to go to the party. Usually, Susie Wood's house, mm -hmm. and uh, and so her house wasn't available this evening and somebody suggested one house and it broke up into factions no I'm not going there I wouldn't be caught dead there and no let's go over here and everything and Pigpen said something which I can't remember what it was but Sherry Huddleston turned around he was Ron McKernan before that moment sure sure Sherry Huddleston turned around and went oh Pigpen give me a break you're always <laughs> saying and everybody just went Pigpen uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and it yeah, stuck. You, you can yeah. see him. Same with Marmaduke. You know, yeah. it's like Marmaduke got his name. He brought uh, Rick Shub brings him in my room, John Dawson, and says, "Dave, don't you think he looks more like a Marmaduke than a John?" Mm -hmm. And I went, Marmaduke. <laughs> and you could see his eyes just sink. You know, he knew that was going to stick. Right. Oh no, I'm going to be Marmaduke. Oh. <laughs> so you're on the you're on the inside story there. It's funny how things are, things are that way, aren't they? Somebody has an impression, they put it out, and then five years later, somebody comes out and says the very same thing, but in different words. It's hard to say, I'm just a guy in TV, and I've been doing it for a long time. And we're real pleased that, you know, you, you've been checking us out. Thank, thank all the people who have been working for the television show this evening. And um, thank you, Pauline, yeah, for making this. Uh, she's our guacamole uh, princess. You know that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's just doing great. We did a wonderful shoot a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday. Dave, or uh, uh, Ed, Ed, is that his name? Uh, he's our director. I, it's hard to tell because his hair is, he can't even, you know, I don't know, he's weird anyway. But he and uh, Steve Brown, we went up to uh, Lakeport and we did, uh, did a show on a friend of mine who's been on all kinds of radio, late night radio uh, TV shows. Uh, th throughout his 60 years of playing music and nobody knows who the hell I was and we went up there and it was just a laugh riot of wits a really cool time so thank you kids for doing that thanks to City Fitness uh, Gym up there in Lakeport that's awful nice of you to sort of do that and you take care of yourselves all right I'm, I'm really I'm trying to, to do my best and put it out we'll talk and see you before too long all right Like the wise man said, and I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. I'll take what you give me for the sake of mankind. 